hello, hello. And hi, 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 Beatle fans. Welcome to another edition of Things We Said Today. This is a bi-weekly podcast show on the Beatles. And on this show, we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Fab Four. Their past, the present, and what's going on today. Their history, their music, their years together, their years apart. Whatever we feel like talking about in the moment, that's what we do here on this show. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the three regular co-hosts of this show. You might know me for my syndicated Beatles radio program called Every Little Thing, currently on over 40 radio stations. And also for another talk show podcast, a bi-weekly show as well, called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast all about the solo careers of the Beatles. And on this show, on Things We Said Today, I'm joined by my two regular co-hosts. First of all, a man who has written a couple of books on the Beatles, one called From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and also Got That Something, How the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything, currently working on a series of books on the solo career of Paul McCartney, and that's Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken, and hello, everyone. And also, we have with us someone who's been a staple part of uh, radio in the New York area for almost 40 years, as he's been on New York's WFUV and all that time. He is their resident Beatle expert. He's done a lot of great specials on the radio, a lot of fantastic interviews as well. And that's Darren DeVivo. Hi, Darren. Hello out there in podcast land. How are you, everyone? (laughs) On today's show, we're going to be celebrating the 50th anniversary, and we do that quite often here on this show, celebrating anniversaries. The 50th anniversary for Paul and Linda McCartney's album, Ram, which is an album that, as everyone knows, has certainly gained in stature in recent years. And we're going to be talking about that album and uh, remembering what it was like when it first came out, although Darren was a wee child at the time but i'm sure that he remembers everything about that album when it first came out and uh but i wasn't winging anymore i was sick (laughs) okay you you made some advancement then a little bit Uh and uh so it's all going to be about ram and we're also going to talk a little bit about a brand new tribute album for ram that just came out called ram on but as usual we will get to the latest in beetle news And we'll start with news that just broke today. Uh, Rolling Stone, as well as everybody, really, Variety and Spin, they are reporting that a new docuseries, McCartney 321, is about to launch on Hulu on July 16th. This is the one we've heard about with Rick Rubin involved as co-producer with McCartney. This will be a six-episode series with Paul going over the entirety of his career his recordings with the Beatles, Wings, and his 50-year solo career. McCartney and Rubin will go over the songwriting influences and personal relationships that have inspired Paul's work over the years. In a statement, Hulu Originals and ABC Entertainment's president, Craig Erwich, said, Never before have fans had the opportunity to hear Paul McCartney share in such expansive celebratory detail the experience of creating his life's work. More than 50 years of culture-defining music. To be an observer as Paul and Rick Rubin deconstruct how some of the biggest hits in music history came to be is truly enlightening. End of quote. So there you have it. The uh, big date will be uh, July 16th when this premieres on Hulu. And I hope it comes out on Blu-ray then after that. Yeah, that would be nice, DVD and Blu-ray, and um, yeah, it, it would be nice if it was shortly after it premieres, or the, the all six episodes right. there. Yeah. Last week, on May 14th, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Ram album, the video, remastered for Three Legs, premiered on YouTube. And I know that I read that they're also supposed to have remastered Heart of the Country, the video premiering on youtube but i haven't seen it there and i just watched it and it looks pretty good just like it did when the remastered cd came out yeah in you know 2012 um, yeah the, the the one that is on youtube is from 2012 but if you download it 
you know, when you download it, it comes also with an audio file and with a text file saying what it is. The text file has uh, something about RAM, RAM 50 on it. So it looks like they might have just replaced the video that was up there and, and all the other materials that were that were in it, but but it still looks like it was posted in 2012. So that could be the update that's there. Okay. Did you read the text, Alan? Yeah. Yeah, okay. that's how I know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, is it just basic information that most of us know about RAM? Yeah, basically, it's 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 almost like a very short press release. I think it says, you know, the only album by Paul and Linda McCartney, and uh, you know, but it but it had some something like a, a web address or something that had RAM 50 in it. So I, I was assuming it was new because of that. Because hmm. that, that same address is given in the text file that comes with the three legs clip. Okay, very good. All right, uh, also as far as RAM is concerned, I'm sure many of our listeners are aware that the half speed master for RAM has just been released. And so all fans of uh, the sound quality of the half speed masters, I'm sure are probably very happy with what just came out. And also according to the Guardian, the Royal Mail has honored Paul McCartney with a set of 12 postage stamps. The main collection features images of eight career-defining albums, solo and with wings. Uh, there's McCartney, Ram, Venus and Mars, McCartney 2, Tug of War, Flaming Pie, Egypt Station, and McCartney 3. A mini sheet of four additional stamps shows McCartney in the recording studio with photos selected from across three decades, recording McCartney in 1970, Ram in 1971, McCartney II in 1980, and Flaming Pie in 1997. The stamps go on sale on May 28th in a wide variety of formats, from a presentation pack to a prestige stamp book and framed images. McCartney is one of only three solo music artists to get his own dedicated stamp issue, Following David Bowie in 2017 and Elton John in 2019, the band Queen were honored with their own stamps in 2020. You can now pre-order these stamps and its many different packages, some of which are listed as limited edition at this website. Go to shop.royalmail.com. There are, in fact, 32 different packages that you can choose from. So they've taken a page out of Paul's uh, recent playbook. <laughs> I'm sure he was no influence on this. <laughs> and that actually actually backs up what I'm about to say. Was anyone else completely overwhelmed when they attempted to buy? Uh, not that everyone listening can answer me, but uh, I was completely overwhelmed looking through all the different packages that they made available. Uh, I, I want to just make sure I get at least one of each stamp. Is, is, does a package exist that's got that in it? I couldn't tell. So, but uh, mm. they all look really, really nice. Nice collectibles. Yeah. It wasn't too long ago that there were John Lennon stamps issued here in the U.S. So it's and, nice to see. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's nice to see the same treatment being given for Paul, although John didn't have all these different packages. <laughs> it was just... What was it? Just the walls and bridges shot, I think. I think. That was easy. Yes, this is not easy. Mm. Okay. Well, speaking of John, a new video was made for the elements mix of Hold On. It's a very simple idea. Taking the front cover of the Plastic Ono Band album and having it look like John and Yoko are there up against the tree and the tree's leaves move and occasional light shines through. Branches move, but John and Yoko stay still through the whole thing, as if you're looking at them from the distance uh, through the course of an entire day. And this is exactly what would have happened. It's a very simple, but I, I think it's a brilliant video. Very Yoko-esque, as far as I'm concerned. Did either of you see it? No, I actually will admit I didn't know it came out. Somehow I missed it. Mm. So I, I have to look for it. Okay, the band Cheap Trick appeared on Howard Stern's show on Sirius XM on May the 11th and performed John Lennon's song, Give Me Some Truth. Uh, a new documentary on the history of Friar Park has now appeared on YouTube. 
This is the mansion that George lived in with his first wife, Patty, and later second wife, Olivia, and son, Danny. Look up Friar Park documentary series. So far, there are three excerpts posted. We mourn the passing of pop and R&B star Lloyd Price, who was best known for hits in the 50s like Stagger Lee, Personality, I'm Going to Get Married. And the Beatles covered Lloyd songs in, his, in their solo careers, John with Just Because on his rock and roll album and Paul with Laudie Miss Claudie on his Russian album. Both those songs were written by Price, and the Beatles used to do Laudie Miss Claudie in concert in their early years. And if I'm not mistaken, I think they also rehearsed it during the Get Back, Let It Be sessions. And uh, recently you heard me talk about a new book, Mock Show in Hamburg, which looks to be a definitive book on the Beatles' time there, written by Thorsten Knobloch. A limited run of 500 copies is now sold out, and the publisher has decided to reprint the book, which uh, Thorsten wrote to me, uh, will be available in about two weeks from now. And finally, congratulations goes out to the next inductees for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, two of which in particular, well, let's say even three, have Beatle connections. Todd Rundgren is about to be inducted. Of course, he's got a lot of Beatle connections, especially with Ringo being in the all-star band on several lineups. The Music Excellence Award, there'll be one going to Billy Preston, which is nice to hear. Carol King will be getting in as a performer. We all know what a great artist she is and what a great songwriter she is and that the Beatles covered some of her songs. And uh, it's Tina Turner as well, as far as some of the, the real veterans who are about to go into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Any comments from you guys about uh, these choices? I, I think the, most of the artists going into the Hall are well-deserved. And in the case of Todd Rundgren, Tina Turner, Carol King, how are they not in already? Yeah. Well, she's in as a in. songwriter. She's in just as a songwriter. No, yeah, but still, as a performer, how is she not in already? I agree. Uh, tapestry. That's all you need to know. It's over. Right. She should have yeah. been in. Uh, Tina Turner, icon. You know, Todd Rundgren, icon. Mm -hmm. Different kind. You know, I've got also some other views on some of the other people who went in, which I won't get into here. I kind of put a little something on my Facebook pages last week, but... You know, the Hall of Fame, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame does it again. They tend to make people happy. They tend to start up very interesting discussions and uh, also arguments about who's in, who's not in, who should be in, the value of the whole organization. I still don't understand how John Mayle is not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, but I won't, <laughs> I won't uh, take it any further than that. But congrats to all of them. Billy Preston, I'll, I'll admit, was somebody that I didn't think would get in, and that was a very, very pleasant surprise. Mm, I'll agree with you there. You know, as soon as I, I found out this news, I, I posted something on my Facebook page, and you know what's about to happen as soon as you do that. You're going to get a slew of people all writing in with all the artists that they feel should be in that are not in. And right. for just one time, you know, I've been angry the last few years that Todd Rundgren wasn't inducted although he was nominated and certainly just, just for Carol King alone, <laughs> you know, and Billy Preston, I'm so happy for them that I just mm -hmm. want to focus on that and not all the people that should be in because right. every single year you're going to be mentioning people that should be in. But uh, my main gripe are the, the artists who started their careers earlier, even fifties artists who are still not in that should be in. And, uh, you know, for years I've been saying on this show, the Moody Blues, until they eventually were inducted. Uh -huh. and, now, and every now and then I go to their own website just so that I know everyone that has been inducted. Because there's always a, a question that I'll, I'll, I'll think about a certain band that I'll say, where, are they in? So I go and check on their website. And for me, it's like Peter, Paul and Mary are not in. And that's a tremendous uh -huh. crime. Wait you a know. minute, Joan Baez in? Yes. She just went in, though, didn't she, recently? Uh, just recently, yeah. yeah. That's true. See, for me, the band for years was Chicago. Mm -hmm. You know, when Chicago finally went in, I was lucky enough to go to the Barclays Center in Brooklyn to that induction. That was, that was very nice. But that was my number one beef for many years, Chicago getting passed over. Mm -hmm. Yep, and we all have our favorites, and they're, I'm sure they're all worthy of getting in. But... Um... 
yeah, it's just uh, I'm just happy right now for these people. <laughs> I'm very happy about that. But uh, and then you've always got the the never ending argument. What is rock and roll? And there are certain artists that you feel are not in the rock genre that get in. And, you know, that there should be a separate category for that or a different hall of fame for that. And, you know, the arguments go on and on. But for right now, I'm just happy for these people. All right. So uh, why don't we get on to our main conversation, which is the 50th anniversary of the album Ram. Ram was the second album released by Paul McCartney in his solo career, actually credited as being a Paul and Linda McCartney album. It was recorded uh, between October from October 16th through April the 7th. Um, October 16th, 1970 to April 7th of 1971 uh, at Columbia Recording Studios and A&R Recording Studios in New York and Sound Recording Studios in Los Angeles. It was released May 17th in the United States, May 21st in the UK. Peaked as high as number two here in the United States on the Billboard charts and yet it went to number one in the UK. Prior to uh, the release of Ram. Another Day was released as a single, and that was recorded during the same sessions. That was released in February as a single. As far as songs from the actual album, Uncle Albert Admiral Halsey was released in the United States on August the 2nd, and it became the first of nine number one singles that Paul had in the U.S., whereas The Backseat of My Car was released as a single in the U.K. That was on August 13th, only getting to number 39. Um, It should be pointed out that Eat at Home was released as a single in various countries, Australia, New Zealand, South America, Japan, and continental Europe. It actually made the top 10 on the charts in New Zealand and the Norwegian and Dutch charts. As I said, uh, it was released as a Paul Linda McCartney album, though it has the seeds of being the start of Wings, since Denny Sywell drummed on it, and uh, Hugh McCracken, who played guitar, on the album after uh david spinoza left hugh was actually offered to be a guitarist in wings but turned it down and so to go into a bit more detail on the ram album why don't we hear from alan i should start with a slight correction actually the first day of sessions for ram was october 12th Um, okay and if you want to think of the the recording period as starting when Paul did the auditions for drummers and guitarists, that goes back to October 9th. It was a really, really complicated album to make. And um, I think I think a lot of people don't quite know that because they haven't, um, you know, really looked closely into what was going on in Paul's life at the time. I was just looking over the uh, the stuff that's going to be in the book about just the Ram sessions and, and the stuff leading up to the Ram sessions. And it's six chapters of the book, Ram. <laughs> um, wow. You know, so just to put it in context, you know, so Paul releases the McCartney album in April and immediately hightails it up to Scotland. He just doesn't want to deal with the fallout of, you know, the the self-interview and everything that was going on around that and, the, you know, the, the financial arguments with John and, uh, you know, so he goes up to Scotland and, you know, partly it's springtime. So he's got a lot of things to do as Paul, the gentleman farmer, seeing to, to all kinds of stuff up there, uh, which is detailed in the book. No reason to go into it now. But while he's doing it, he had his guitars with him, obviously, and, p- and a piano. And he started writing songs for what was going to be his next album, which he didn't really have a clear concept of. Um, And he wrote all through that spring and summer um, and into the fall. And that includes, for instance, they went on, they went on a bunch of trips, you know, up to upper reaches of Scotland. And uh, I think they they popped into the Orkneys. And in the course of that, uh, they had to take a little boat trip between some of the islands. And during that, he wrote some of what became Uncle Albert and Admiral Halsey. 
also some of that was written just in the car on the way up. There is a section, uh, you'll know which section I mean, but it used to be a separate song before he melted, you know, stitched it into Uncle Albert and Admiral Halsey called Gypsy Get Around. And that was a separate song originally and very Beach Boys like. So, you know, that was that was something for the, you know, the girls, Heather and, and Mary with Linda, I guess, to sing in the car when they were driving up. And, you know, it just became an element of this album. By the end of the summer, he put together a cassette demo um, of all the stuff he had been recording through the summer. Um, and it had 29 songs. And oh. why don't I read you the list? Um, Heart of the Country, Too Many People, Why Am I Crying? That's probably, that, that could be 4th of July, because that's part of the lyrics of that song. Possibly. Why Am I Crying, It's the 4th of July. Mm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay. Backseat of My Car, So Sad. Do you know what that was? Hmm. Oh, so maybe another sad. day. Yep. Yeah. Um, Gypsy Get Around, Ram On. Uh, you, you get the impression listening to the album that Ram On might have been just a, a little, you know, impromptu studio thing he did, but he actually wrote it during the summer. Three songs for Rupert. Uh, he had thought about doing Rupert as a movie and had acquired the rights to the character. Uh, during the time of the McCartney album. So there are versions of a, a Sunshine Sometime guitar song instrumental, uh, also known as When the Wind Blows. And right. the third one was Little Lamb Dragonfly. That was originally meant to be for Rupert. So those are the first 10. Then Smile Away, Love is Long, which became part of... Long-haired lady. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And then the next part, too, Come On, Little Lady. Mm -hmm. Come On, Little Lady was Eat at Home. Um, And it was part of a medley with a thing called Buddy's Breakfast and Indeed I Do. Then Monkberry Moon Delight, which was part of a medley with a thing called Frenzy. Get On the Right Thing, Little Woman Mm -hmm. Love, Country Dreamer, Long Haired Lady, the rest of the Long Haired Lady, (laughs) I Lie Around, Three Legs, we're so sorry, which we now know as Uncle Albert. Um, so we've now had two parts of Uncle Albert. We're so sorry and Gypsy Get Around. Let's see, A Love for You, uh, She Can't Be Found, which was Hey Diddle. Right. Some People Never Know, Hands Across <laughs> the Water, which is the third part of Uncle Albert, Admiral Halsey, Tomorrow, Big Barn Bed, Great Day, and I Am Your Singer. That's 29 songs. And yet he still wrote more on the way to New York. Uh, what he did was uh, they, they went to the south of France, celebrated Linda's birthday down there, drove up to, I think, Le Havre, and took the SS France to New York. Uh, the SS France was a luxury liner. Incredible thing. I mean, in the book, we have a lot, a bit about the boat, you know, how much alcohol was consumed on an average trip, stuff like that. Interesting little details. On the boat, he wrote um, the flip side of Another Day, A a Woman, A Why. And then in New York, during the sessions, he wrote Dear Boy. So it was an incredibly productive period for him creatively. Uh, And yet he got to New York. He didn't have a band. He knew he had to audition one. So local 802 of the Musicians Union provided him with a contractor. A contractor is the guy who basically signs up all the musicians. But, you know, they didn't just do it and deliver the musicians. Paul wanted to audition. So they gave Paul a list of guitarists and a list of drummers. And Paul rented a couple of rehearsal spaces and auditioned drummers and guitarists. The drummers and the guitarists were not really thrilled to be going to an audition. I mean, these were hardcore New York freelance players who played like, you know, 15 sessions a week. And they really kind of weren't used to having to go to an audition. Plus, uh, the auditions were a little bit weird for the drummers. Paul set up a cheap drum kit in this little basement room he had hired 
And he didn't play with them. He just sat there and said, okay, now play a rock beat. Okay, now play something a little jazzy, you know, whatever. And, it, and the drummers had to sort of sit there on their own doing, you know, whatever they could as close to what they thought he was asking to hear. You know, and the guitarists too, uh, you know, the guitarists, I think uh, in some cases he actually did play with them. But in fact, David Spinoza, who was the one that he picked, said, you know, we're not used to auditioning. And Paul was already getting the feeling that a lot of people were put out at having to audition. And they said, well, you know, we're on, we're on half the pop records you hear, you know, we do a lot of work, you could listen to our records. And Paul basically said, you know, I, I know something about making records. And I know that what you hear on a record is not necessarily how the person plays, you know, and I want to hear you guys play live. So, you know, he understood that that they were a little upset and he understood why, but he held his ground on that. And as you know, in the end, he chose Denny Sywell as the drummer, David Spinoza as the guitarist. Hugh McCracken was also on the list, but at the time he was in Florida recording at Criterion Studios with Aretha Franklin. So he wasn't around for the auditions. Spinoza, as I'm sure you know, um, was only on the sessions for a couple of weeks. And basically what happened there is, you know, Paul was very happy with his playing. You know, he's on another day. He's on a, a few other things, uh, including some things that ended up on Red Rose Speedway, like uh, Get on the Right Thing. But... You know, David Spinoza was a busy young guy. And what was happening is that Paul and Linda said to him and to Danny, uh, we'd like you to reserve the next month for us. You know, just don't take any other bookings. It's just reserved. But they also began canceling sessions because what would happen would be that they would record the basic tracks all together. And then Paul would later go in and record the bass lines and later on the vocals and things like that. So there were times he didn't need the other musicians there. Um, and that's how he arranged it. But if you were David Spinoza, who was doing 15 sessions a week, and you were keeping your full week free, and then Tuesday and Thursday were canceled, you know, you're out two days pay. You know, because he wasn't paying them for days they weren't working. Um, mm. When they were working, he was paying triple scale. So you could look at it either way. I mean, Danny obviously didn't have a problem with it, but David Spinoza did. And the last week that Spinoza worked, it was really only half a week. At the end of the, of the first week, Linda had said, uh, okay, we're not going to need you next week. They were going to take the whole week off and do, you know, bass dubs and vocals, whatever. Plus... Paul had business meetings. I'll get into that. Um, <laughs> so Spinoza went home and he had been told he could have the week off. And so he told his uh, booker that he was free and booked sessions for, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Then Sunday night, Linda called him and said, um, we actually will need you next week. And Spinoza said, look, I'm available Monday and Tuesday, but beyond that, I've booked sessions and I can't, I can't get out of them, you know? And Linda said, well, you know, it's Paul McCartney. And he said, yeah, I understand that. Um, and it's nothing against Paul and it's nothing against you, but I'm a freelancer. And if I take a job, I don't walk away from it just because something better came up. And you have to understand that when you guys go back to London, I'm still here in New York, freelancing as a session player and these are the people i work with and i can't just call and get out of sessions so um paul decided to look for another guitarist and he asked denny if there were people that he liked working with and he said well you know there's this guy hugh mccracken who by now was back in new york and was free so he called hugh and said can you come to the next session and hugh did but hugh assumed it was an audition because that was the last he had heard that Paul was having auditions, you know. So he turned up at nine o'clock in the morning to start working on the session. And uh, they were working on backseat of my car that day. So they're working on that. And, and Hugh walks in and says, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm, 
I thought this was an audition, so I really can only work until two, and then I have another session. So you can imagine, you know, Paul must be wondering about what the New York freelance world is because <laughs> everybody has other stuff to do, you know? He's not right. used to that. His first album having been just him, and he was always available for himself when he wanted to record, you know? So, you know, but then uh, Hugh uh, started working. They they got on really well. He played beautifully. And uh, at the end of the New York sessions in January, Paul had sort of um, a rap party. He hired a, a floor of a restaurant and invited the engineers, the, you know, other players, including David Spinoza and all of their wives to just sort of come to this, you know, rap party. And uh, so that was that. Now, meanwhile, what's going on is during that summer when he was writing those 29 songs, he was also trying to figure out whether it made sense to sue the Beatles to split the partnership, something he really didn't want to do, something that Lee Eastman advised him would be extremely difficult to win. But John Eastman, who at this point was really handling more of Paul's stuff, sort of felt, okay, you know, I understand what my father's saying, but you want to get out of this partnership and get on with your life and also have the money from the partnership released for each of you. Um, it's kind of the only way to do it. Uh, the, the good part of it was that they weren't going to be suing Klein which actually Paul would have wanted to do, but it would have been actually harder to win if he was a party to it. Since he wasn't a party to it, he couldn't you know, testify. He could make a statement. He provided an affidavit, but uh, it, it would have made it a, a different kind of case. It would have been harder, possibly. At one point, uh, John Eastman flew over to Scotland and he and Paul went walking in the hills. And that was when Paul made the decision to go ahead. So he goes to New York knowing that this thing is in the works. And so that was, you know, in between sessions, he had to go to have meetings at Eastman and Eastman, not only with the Eastmans, but with their British lawyers who had flown to New York. So Paul was meeting with them. And he's also continuing, you know, he's, his relationship with Linda, you know, they married in 69, but this is only 1970. So he's still getting to know the family a bit better. I mean, during a lot of this time, Mary and Heather attended the sessions and sat in the control room. Some of the time they were with Linda's sister, Laura. And I think it was probably at Laura's house during a, you know, Paul needed some downtime at, at one point after a few weeks. Uh, and they went to see Eric Clapton at the Fillmore and then drove out to Long Island and hung out with Laura. And it was there that he wrote Dear Boy, you know, which is about Linda's ex, really, you know. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, should I take a break and let you guys no, say but something? You know what fascinates me about this whole thing? Well, first of all, just just the mere fact that, that Paul was so amazingly prolific at this time with all these other problems weighing on him. Yeah. <laughs> you would think that would get in the way of it all. Right. But still, he kept on writing so much. Mm -hmm. But can you just answer, I don't know if you're at liberty to discuss this, but how did you find out this list of 29 songs? Uh, what kind of proof is there for that? Ah, uh, well, the cassette exists. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It was found in 2011 in a drawer, um, probably up in Scotland, I think. And it was in an envelope with the logo of the Compagnie Générale Trans Transatlantique, which was the company that owned and operated the SS France, which was the boat Paul sailed over to New York on. So he brought that cassette with him. But yeah, there's... That the cassette exists and Paul has it. And that would have been nice to put in the RAM archival <laughs> box set. Tell me about it. You know, that's, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it really do, would have. <laughs> do you do you, do you just picture like in a in the, a drawer in your house where you would have band aids, rubber bands, pencil erasers, some spare pennies, and whatnot? That Paul has a drawer like that in his house. Oh, and there's a cassette tape in there. Yeah, uh, with, with all of these demos. So underneath the uh, package of uh, 
unopened chewing gum and uh, band-aids. Oh, here's Ram tracks. Yeah. You know, Paul began, it was sometime after the Ram sessions, Paul began, I think, archiving his stuff a lot more carefully. Um, but this cassette was, you know, once it served its purpose, he threw it in a drawer, forgot about it, you know, and when his archive was being assembled, I guess it, it just didn't occur to him. And then it, at some point, someone found it. Uh, it might have been, you know, he might have been clearing up stuff from uh, from Scotland uh, because, you know, at a certain point, he stopped spending time there. He hasn't been there in a long time. You know, Sussex became his his headquarters eventually. But it was at this time, it was High Park, his, his farm in Scotland, which he still owns. Hmm. Yeah. I have a question. Hmm. Uh, and, I, and I will admit that I am actually reading this off of Wikipedia. Hmm. Uh, but being a Bronx native, this jumped out at me. Is it true that some of the auditions uh, for the players uh, were held in the Bronx, in a basement in the Bronx? No. No, the basement no. auditions were all on West 43rd Street, just about okay. a block and a half from the New York Times. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because it, uh, it actually has the source of where that came from. But uh, it says here that uh, West... Um, Auditions held in an attic on 45th Street for three days, where David Spinoza was recruited as guitarist by Linda, mm -hmm. before auditions moved to a Bronx basement, no. where Denny Sywell was brought in to play drums. Now, the, first of all, the, the drum auditions were first, okay. um, and they were all on uh, October 9th on 43rd Street. When you're mentioning all these songs that he composed then, and even during the sessions when he was writing... I have a few other songs that are listed, mm -hmm. like I Lie Around. I didn't say that one. During... I don't think I you think did. I think you oh, did. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I I'm think sorry. that. Oh, yeah. No, it's here. Number 19. <laughs> okay. And uh, Grey Cock and Seagull Race. You know, right. Uh, Grey Cock and Seagull Race was basically a jam that he recorded after his first trip back to London for the first day of the, of the court case. He came back and basically he had already dismissed uh, Denny and Hugh and was just, you know, doing things like vocals and the orchestrations and stuff like that. And uh, he went in and recorded the Grey Cock and Seagull Race. And then uh, later on at the end of 71, when they went back to New York, uh, he took the tape out again and they did some additions to it. In addition... There was something else. Um, it's that big jam. Road all night. Road all night. Right now, that was that was recorded the day that it was Hugh's first day when he had to be out by two to go to another session. Uh, so they worked on backseat of my car that morning, and then in the afternoon after lunch, they came back in to the studio. And Paul picked up uh, his green and black uh, Firebird guitar and Denny got behind the kit and the two of them just were sort of jamming away and uh and, and Denny thought it was you know absolutely a knockout I mean he he kept over the years kept bringing up that recording again you know to see if Paul could do something else with it you know mm. um, but it was very impromptu but so right. that one was also written right in the studio so even with even with 29 songs to choose from he still kept doing more new things. And, and you know, that, that could have been something. They could have done something with that. It, it obviously was very uh, basic at that point, And Paul would have had to write a lyric to it, you know, beyond the couple of lines he had. But it's but a, he, did, he did develop that song into a full song. Well, sort of. A little bit ends up in another song that he gave to Roger Daltrey. Um, yeah, called Giddy. Yeah. I, 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 I'm not sure that counts as a development of that song or just a pirating a bit of, of a bit of that song into something else that he did a few years later. Um, I think it's more complete, but that's me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's also a different song. Yeah. Okay. So they, they finished the New York sessions. I mean, first they, they finished at Columbia and the reason they finished at Columbia is because they were, they had gone through the time that they had booked the studio and there were, and it was already booked for beyond that. So they couldn't, continue using it. So 
Denny and Hugh went their own ways and Paul went to A&R. <clears throat> well, first he went to a smaller Columbia studio that he could use for a couple of days to work on some vocals. Uh, the 30th Street studio. The, most of the album was recorded on the you know, 52nd Street studio, which no longer exists. And neither does the 30th Street studio, which was a, a big church uh, converted into a studio. And uh, he did some vocals there and then went to A&R, continued to do vocals and other overdubs and background vocals with Linda. A lot of the harmonies were added there. And that is where he also did the orchestral overdubs for Backseat of My Car, uh, Little Lamb Dragonfly, which didn't even end up on that album. And uh, Long Haired Lady and Uncle Albert. Uncle Albert. And there was one more. It might have been I Lie Around. So all of that, you know, he had asked George Martin to do those songs and George Martin sent them by mail to New York, so he had to wait until he got them. Then he had to contract players, which, uh, you know, isn't something that contracting orchestra players wasn't really something that Paul did, you know. A&R Studios, uh, one of the owners was Phil Ramone. He was the R. Uh, so Phil Ramone got a contractor to bring in, um, you know, the players for the sessions. And it was really an all-star cast. It's often said to be the New York Philharmonic, but it's not the New York Philharmonic. There was, however, a large contingent of people who were either currently in the New York Philharmonic or had recently retired. But there were also jazz guys. The bassist Ron Carter was in there. So it was, you know, it wasn't the New York Philharmonic, but it, it, it had some New York Philharmonic DNA. So maybe that's why people say it. Actually, people say it because it got into some of the early press releases. And so that became accepted lore. Not totally true. And Paul wanted Phil Ramone to conduct the sessions because George Martin wasn't around. And Phil Ramone, who was trained as a classical violinist, basically talked Paul into doing it. And so you've seen, especially in the Ram book, you know, from, from the deluxe edition, you, you can see pictures of him conducting the orchestra, wearing that sort of stag deer sweater. Um, and in fact, actually, one of the pictures on those British stamps is from Paul conducting the orchestra sessions. Huh. So, yeah, so he did that. I think there were two days of those sessions and they um, arranged them you know, very logically, uh, you know, the, some, each song required a different kind of ensemble. And so they worked it out so that, you know, where there was overlap, those would be recorded the same day and, you know, afternoon and morning sessions. Anyway, at the end of that, they had all of this stuff. I mean, they had quite a lot recorded already. Most, pretty much all the album and, and most of the outtakes actually, you know, in LA, they did Dear Boy and they did, you know, a couple of other things, not very consequential things like now hear this song of mine and uh, which he started in New York as well, which was really just made to be part of a promo thing, you know, which was funny because he put out this promo disc with, of him singing this song, now hear this song of mine. And it, it was to be used in ads and it's not even on the album. It's not even really a real song, you know, could have become one like, like road all night, you know, if he finished it, but it was just really kind of a, a little thing he played in various ways to be used on this, this little album of promo spots. But so, you know, the dear boy was the main thing they, they recorded in LA. And in the course of this, there were a couple of trips to London because first of all, uh, Paul decided that he wanted to release a single. He decided this even before he left New York. And in fact, uh, another day and a woman, a why were mastered in New York, um, so that it could be released on the first day of the court case. James Paul McCartney versus John George and Ringo and Apple, which is kind of funny because it's, you know, here it is, this big momentous case just about to start. And what does Paul release as a single? It's just another day, you know? <laughs> 
that was that for irony effect or what? I, I really don't know. He's never commented on that, but it can't possibly have escaped him. What also didn't escape Northern songs and Macklin music is that it was credited Mr. and Mrs. McCartney and Northern songs immediately said, oh no, you don't. You are signed exclusively to us. And if it's not Lennon McCartney, that's one thing, but it's not going to be McCartney McCartney. We're not letting you do that. By this point, he had decided that Ram was going to be their album and that all the songs on it would be credited to both of them. Now, whether that was a ploy to get a bigger royalty, which is what Northern Songs and Macklin Music insisted, or whether he legitimately wanted Linda to be a collaborator. I mean, he's never come around and said, yeah, it was the royalty thing, except that he did say at one point before the disillusion of the Beatles was finally, you know, finally took place. He said, actually, Linda is the only one here who makes any money because all my money goes into Apple. Linda is not signed to Apple. So when she gets royalties, she gets paid. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it may have had a practical aspect. It may have just been, you know, what he envisioned as his future, you know, that he and Linda would write together. They would become a team. Uh, she had collaborated on a couple of things, even on the McCartney albums. So uh, it seemed to be what he wanted. Uh, they had, so anyway, one of the reasons they had to go to London was to visit with their lawyer about the Northern Songs and Macklin suit uh, and ATV, which at this point owned it all. But so that was one trip. And the other trip was uh, to go to the first day of the lawsuit against Apple. So a bit of flying back and forth and, uh, you know, just trying to get this album together. And in the end, you know, Irik the Norwegian with Paul looking over his shoulder sort of assembled the track list that Paul, you know, set out. Anyway, so I yeah. think that's uh, an overview. Uh, my main question after everything you just said, Alan, is when is your book coming out? <laughs> <laughs> Not soon <laughs> enough. <laughs> now, um, this is all fantastic information that you're offering here that for most of us, we've never heard before. So, really? Huh. Thank you. For a lot yeah, of it. Uh, for a lot of it, yeah. It was unbelievable. Well, I thank you. We, we, we work very hard on this book. <laughs> So Ken and I are coming up to break into your house and get a manuscript. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you could repeat the part that came after McCartney was released in April 1970. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, how long after, uh, and then we could, we, I'm sure we want to sink our teeth into the album a bit. And, but uh, in, in a nutshell, how much was Paul toying with the idea of forming a band which would become wings when he was doing ram if not how long once the work was done on the album did paul think you know what i want to be in the band again it did occur to him um and not just not just because he you know knew that at some point he wanted to go back on the road uh i mean he wanted to go back on the road at the end of the beatles and he was saying to John, you know, let's uh, let's let's just tour around in a little bus and make him right. come two stops at a little bar, which is sort of what he ended up doing with Wings, except it was a university right. instead of a bar. Um, OK, but in New York, um, during one of the sessions, first of all, Sid Bernstein happened to pop by by mistake, went into the wrong studio because the Rascals, which he represented, were in one of the other CBS studios. Now, it's unlikely it was really a mistake, but he wanted to say hi to Paul and they had a chat. And Sid um, proposed the idea of, the, of Paul getting a band together and doing a tour with the Rascals. Paul probably never seriously thought of that, but uh, Sid did leak it to Rolling Stone. Um, and at the same time, there was this other report in Rolling Stone and elsewhere in some Boston newspapers about a show that Paul supposedly had agreed to play in Boston to raise money for a new sort of auditorium where concerts could be held up there. So the 
talk of Paul putting a band together and touring was in the air. Um, and it wasn't all that long after he got back to England, you know, a, a couple of months before he called Denny and Hugh and invited them over to Scotland. And on one hand, he invited them over, you know, bring your wives, we'll have a holiday, we'll just have some fun, we'll jam and all that. But Denny seems to remember that the idea of putting a band together was sort of clear. It was like, you know, bring your drums, and we'll see what we can do. And the reason that, that Hugh didn't join actually uh was there were a few reasons i've always heard that well that the biggest reason it may not be the biggest reason why hugh said no was that he was in fact living the dream he mm -hmm. loved being a session guitarist and he was a very much in demand session guitarist and he was getting all the work that he wanted he, right. he loved that life he wanted to stay in new york you know he was very happy having that kind of a life and he didn't want to be a touring rock star you know, Denny Sywell had that too, in a way, but he decided that he wanted to throw in his lot with Paul. And, you know, by the time of uh, just before Band on the Run, when he left, I think he regretted that choice a little bit. I think he, in the end, sort of felt that maybe in a way he made the wrong choice. I don't think he would go as far as saying he made the wrong choice because, hell, he was a member of Wings for, you know, a couple of years there, uh, did some touring, did some recording, uh, and there's a lot of people who know him now only because of that. So I don't think he regrets it in that way, but um, financially, I think he did. But is it true, based on whatever research you've come across, that Paul's money was tied up in Apple at the time, and that's why he couldn't get paid or the other members couldn't get paid what they were promised? Well, yeah. To a large degree, except that so when Paul would sign up to do something like James Paul McCartney TV special and got, you know, a, a, a signing advance for that and that money he could get, you know, every now and then they would go and have a chat with Paul's manager or with with John Eastman and say, what can we do? And they were always told, look, the time isn't right. Paul can't get his money out of Apple yet. It'll happen. Uh, just just sit tight. The, the business life of Paul McCartney is a very, very, very complicated thing. Um, you know, there were other problems too. They wanted to be put under contract as a band, but Denny Lane was still represented by a manager, Tony Secunda, who considered that Denny owed him an album, it turned out to be, but really some money. Uh, he settled for the album uh, because Denny was going to, he had put together this group called Balls. Anyone remember Balls? They put out a couple of I records. Heard of them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> they put out a couple of, of singles, um, but never finished their album. And it, it just, didn't work out, but the manager, Tony Secunda, had paid for, you know, the sessions and for a lot of stuff. And so he considered that all the guys in Balls owed him something. And, and most of them got around it by doing an album or something or whatever. And Denny was like, I think the last. But until that, Denny wasn't able to enter into a contract with Paul and the other members of Wings because Tony Secunda owned a piece of him. So it, hmm. it was very complicated. I think we, we did our best to sort of sort it out in the book and uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy reading it when it eventually <laughs> comes out, yes. which will be sometime that's, that's, in 2022. Yeah, the McCartney legacy, mm -hmm. volume one. Alan, do you have, do you have an, uh, an alarm system on your house? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. All right, good to know. <laughs> Let me ask you this, Alan, and uh, I'll address this to you too, Darren. When you take a look at the year 1970 and what went on with all four Beatles and what they released as solo artists, and yeah, Ringo made a splash a bit with Sentimental Journey and Blue Coos of Blues, and the first McCartney album went to number one. But at the end of the year, you had an album that was critically acclaimed from John Lennon with the Plastic Arnold Band, mm -hmm. and it did go top 10. So it did do well commercially. And then you had this triple album called All Things Must Pass. And George was like the darling of mm -hmm. the Beatles in mm -hmm. the press. 
and he could do no wrong at that point. And it was such an explosion to have that back to back with the Plastic Ono Band. Do you think there was an enormous amount of pressure on Paul to produce an album that would become something considered a classic, a brilliant, high quality album after the commercial and the critical success of, of All Things Must Pass and, and at least the critical success and some commercial success of Plastic on Old Band. Did he feel that going into this album or did he just say, well, this is my first real serious album after making an album where I played all the instruments. So I'm going to get really good musicians and session musicians and do something right here and, and put out, you know, great recordings or, or very strong recordings of my latest stuff. Well, Plastic Ono Band wasn't out at the time he started the sessions for Ram. So that wouldn't have been any pressure. Um, by the time they both came out, that and all things must pass, you know, he might have been feeling some pressure. But, you know, here's the thing about Paul McCartney, and, and you know this, he doesn't need the pressure of John and George and even Ringo doing a good album to make him want to do a good album. I mean, he wants to do the best he can do, even in a vacuum. You know, it, it, it's what the others were doing. I mean, he was in a way competitive with them, probably. I mean, like anybody in that situation would be. But I think he was, you know, trying to make the best album he could anyway. That's why it was taking so long, because there were all these songs and any of them could have been on the album. And he then had to pick, you know, which ones it, it would be and which ones to finish and which ones to save for later, you know, and saving for later was a, a sort of a new concept for him. You know, the Beatles rarely had stuff that they saved and there was really very little on the first McCartney album, except for, you know, when the wind is blowing uh, one of the Rupert songs that was left over. Uh, so, you know, this was this was sort of new. I mean, he's recording tons of material for, you know, B-sides for Red Rose Speed, what became Red Rose Speedway, all kinds of things. But he was really supposed to be just making an album. Um, he could have taken the first 10 songs he recorded and that could have been the album, but um, he didn't, you know, he just kept working and working. Um, and that's, you know, that's probably what they were perceiving as an inability to finish. You know, he just wanted to go and make sure he had, I guess, I guess the optimum, optimum stuff, you know, that, that he could put on this album and it would really be a blockbuster. Hmm. Now, I was going to say, let me play, uh, I don't know, play devil's advocate here. I would have thought McCartney would have had an enormous amount of pressure, maybe pressure that he put on himself with McCartney coming out of Abbey Road and having to prove himself as a solo artist. Uh, I always thought McCartney was a very interesting first album to put out. If I was doing it, you know, I would want Abbey Road too. You know what I'm saying? Right. And McCartney was not that. McCartney was a very bold move to do the anti-Abbey Road. Now, I was too young. All right. Uh, I... I <laughs> I pointed. I was born in 1965. I'm five years old when McCartney comes out. I'm six when Ram comes out. I had no concept of any of this, although I was aware what they were doing. I was aware that they had just broken up. I sort of got the gist of things. And later on, I found out that like the critics were really tough on McCartney because he was perceived as the guy who broke the Beatles up. And the critic, the the, the reviews of McCartney were pretty harsh. I would think that Paul felt pressure to deliver with Ram, being that it seemed like the world was against him. Do you think that any of that was the case and uh, his decision to make the type of album he did with McCartney? And was he feeling pressure with Ram, not only because of what George did and what John did, but the perception that uh, the critics, the public had? Well, there's that. Him. That's yeah. There's really something to that. And in addition, one thing I didn't mention is that um, so around Christmas 1970, he and Linda and the girls went back to Scotland uh, for, you know, the, for the holidays, basically. And it was while they were there that the first installment of John's Rolling Stone interview came out. 
Now, the harshest stuff was actually in the second installment, but there were a number of little barbs in the first installment that, you know, got under his skin a bit. So he not only had the competitive pressure, but he also had, you know, what John's saying about him in the press publicly. That can't have been too comfortable either. And it and also probably pushed him on. You know, I mean, John asked that he John was asked what he thought of McCartney's album, which would have been McCartney at that point. And he said, yeah, Paul's album is rubbish. You know, that can't have uh, gone over very well. Mm -hmm. And it could be yeah. that, you know, in a way, I mean, to use the comparison Darren set up about Abbey Road and versus McCartney, you know, McCartney was a little more like the Let It Be album, except, you know, that Obviously, there was overdubbing because it was just him, but it was simple and off the cuff and straightforward, like Let It Be was supposed to be. And Ram was a little bit more like Abbey Road. And, you know, there were some orchestrations. There's a you know great variety of things. There are songs, you know, like Uncle Albert is really three songs joined together. Long Haired Lady is a couple of songs joined together. Another Day was a couple of songs joined together. So, um, you know, it's, it's much more in the Abbey Road style. So, you know, maybe you're, you're right. Maybe he felt that, okay, doing the let it be thing just got me critical brickbats. Maybe I should, you know, up my game for the second one. Right. And thus go to a studio, hire musicians who, you know, to, to play on the session and make a record a little similar to how, you know, he, what he had been doing with the Beatles as opposed to a homemade thing where let's just, I'll plug this in here and see what happens, you know, like Mac what McCartney was. Yeah. I just want to add something. Um, all this, you know, blather for me, and I have not mentioned my, my co-author, Adrian Sinclair, and I'm, you know, sitting here feeling extremely guilty about that. So I should mention it. You know, this book is a collaboration between the two of us, and Adrian did an awful lot of work and research as well. And uh, not to mention that part of the process of writing the, the book was like there were a lot of you know, mysteries turn up, you know, what do they mean? What, what does this mean? This, can it have been this day if he was also here? You know, that kind of thing. And we spent a lot of time going back and forth and digging out stuff and, you know, arguing, you know, what the logic of something was. Uh, so this is really the two of us. And I, I don't want to seem like I'm taking all the credit for it. Mm. And you mentioned, I think, our last show. We're looking at 2022 for this first volume. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, COVID has taken its toll in the publishing world. And uh, so things have gotten put back a bit, which is a, a, a pity because it was supposed to be out like this summer. And right. I, I would have enjoyed that. <laughs> yeah. Can't wait. Can't wait. Can't wait. Uh, we're recording this actually on the actual 50th anniversary of the U.S. release. It just struck me, May 17th. Mm -hmm. Just the right I, I, I planned it that way. I planned it that way, Darren. <laughs> All right. Well, now I I already mentioned that I was six when Ram came out. I yet have vivid memories of hearing Uncle Albert Admiral Halsey on the radio. I was very much into. Uh, Listening to WABC, those from the New York City area will know Music Radio, WABC. And my mom bought me the Uncle Albert Admiral Halsey single. And the things I remember, I don't, you know, I don't remember what I, you know, two hours ago what I was doing. But I can remember when I got my record, Paul and Linda McCartney threw me. Because you, all you'd hear on the radio was, no, Paul McCartney is Paul McCartney. Here's Paul McCartney, Paul and Linda McCartney. And the title threw me, too, as a six-year-old, What's an Uncle Albert Admiral Halsey? Probably radio was also just saying it was Uncle Albert was the name of the song. Mm -hmm. um, so I was very much aware of what was going on at that time and loved that song uh, and too many people. But I didn't really get to sink my teeth into Ram the album until a few years later when I believe I got it as a birthday gift in the mid-'70s. But Ken and Alan, not to not to, you know, point out that you're older than me, 
Uh, the two of you have memories of getting the record, putting it on your turntable for the first time, or your eight track player. Uh, and what, so, what was your impression? You're a year removed from the Beatles breaking up, you know, with the, that becoming a public uh, a thing uh, when McCartney announced it a year later. Now, here's Ram McCartney album number two. What were your initial impressions? Do you remember? Uh, your initial uh, reactions to Ram. I guess maybe Alan should... Uh, no, Alan talked a lot. Let him rest his throat. <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, you, you, you mentioned first your, your thoughts. You know, I remember liking the album when it first came out. It's not like I was blown away by it. I just liked all the songs. And, you know, in, in the back of my mind as a 10, 11-year-old, I wasn't thinking to myself, a year ago, the Beatles broke up. And then on this date, John released this and George released this on that day. I wasn't thinking in those terms. There was just so much music pouring out of the four of them as individuals that I certainly never felt any loss for the Beatle breakup. There was right. just so much more music yeah. coming out of them. And this was just the latest one that Paul had put out. I didn't compare it to the first McCartney album. I just liked all the songs and played it all the way through and liked it thoroughly. And it's only, you know, as years have gone by and decades have gone by that I like the album more and more. You know, we could get into this even more because of the fact that nowadays it's looked upon as being, for some McCartney fans and music fans, his best album. Mm -hmm. And that's not what was said at the time when it first came out. Although I know Alan has some information about that, about the reviews, whereas most of us are so used to hearing about all the negative reviews that came out at the time, especially with Rolling Stone. You know, for me, I was unaffected by all that stuff. I just bought the album, played it a lot, liked it a lot, listened to each album as it came out without making all these comparisons. And, um, you know, I think that today it sounds like a very modern album, as though it could have just come out today. It sounds really fresh. And it has, you know, all the hallmarks of a great McCartney album, which is a lot of variety, extreme eclecticism, incredible hooks, incredible melodies, possibly, possibly the best vocals of Paul in his solo career throughout an entire album. And that's saying a lot because his vocals have been amazing for, you know, most of the time in his solo career. And, um, you know, there, there's an element of quirkiness about this album where there are songs that are very disciplined and they're just they're done perfectly and then there's very freeform stuff like monk very moon delight or three legs and that gives it a real freshness to it and um for the people that love all the when when mccartney rocks out and wants him to be edgier you can't get much better than monk very moon delight or smile away or too many people and those songs you want the screaming voice from Paul? You got it on this album. And as witnessed with everything else that he had been writing at the time and what's ended up as bonus tracks or, you know, the B-side, A Woman, A Why, great vocal there, screaming vocal. It was an amazing time for him. He was, as Alan pointed out, so prolific. He was on fire. Once you, once you look back now at this period at all the music that he was writing, some of which he held off on releasing, it's it's truly an amazing album. But at the time when it came out, it was just a very good album to me. Not one that I, at that age, you don't really analyze anything. You're just taking it in and trying to, to enjoy it. And I definitely enjoyed Ram from the get-go. Hmm. Alan, your uh, first impressions? Yeah, I don't really remember my first impressions that much, um, other than that... I know that I didn't like Long Haired Lady much. I didn't like Monkberry Moon Delight that much. And, you know, again, at the time, the world was pretty much divided into John people and Paul people. And I was mostly a John person at that point. I liked some things Paul did, but I liked what John was doing better. I liked what George was doing better. And... So I probably didn't even give it a fair hearing at the time. So it was um, a bit later that I finally got into it. And, um, you know, obviously writing this, I got more into it than 
ever before because of listening to outtakes and listening to, you know, the, trying to reconstruct the way the songs were put together in the studio. And, uh, you know, and now, uh, backseat in my car, uh, is like one of my favorite McCartney songs ever. Uh, you know, I don't know why it took so long for that to grab me in, in the way that it does now, but, um, you know, it's an incredibly complex recording and also listening more closely to Linda's harmonies, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said about what she has done on this album. And, uh, you know, if you listen closely, which, at, you know, at the time it came out, I probably didn't do it, you know, would hear tracks on the radio. Um, I don't think I got it for a few years uh, after it came out. But, uh, you know, when when I finally did, there were there were some songs, I mean, I always liked Backseat in My Car a bit, you know, not, not to the degree now, uh, and too many people. Um, I know, you know, what the lore about too many people is and John taking it personally and, and all of that, you know, so there was some tracks I liked, some tracks I didn't like, but, you know, now I look at it as more as a, a unified piece of work and, uh, you know, really like it basically as an album. I, I, I think it's one of his best. I don't think I would say it's his best, but it's up there. Um, the reviews, I was just looking, uh, looking it over again, and, and there were some positive reviews. There were also, you know, probably more negative reviews, and the negative reviews were violent. <laughs> <laughs> well, or let's say vehement. You know, for instance, uh, in The Guardian, Jeffrey Cannon uh, had first listened to it at, uh, you know, they had one of these playing sessions like they have now. Uh, Tony Barrow had been enlisted to do the press for this for Paul, but Paul wasn't interested in coming down to London and meeting with the press. He was, he just wanted Tony to get all the press together in a room and play it for them. He was not available for questions or anything like that. And, you know, in PR terms, that was probably a mistake. But so Jeffrey Cannon went to the group listening, you know, where people were basically not listening. They were just sort of talking and all that. And he wrote, Ram will sound very good against the converse, against conversation at a party, but listen to it by itself. And it's a little more, it's little more than style, skill, and echoes of the days when the Beatles attended to the society of which they were a fulcrum. If you admire Paul McCartney, much better to once again listen to Revolver. So a lot of the reviews were like that. Some were worse. I mean, when Chris Charlesworth in uh, Melody Maker, his review was entitled Mutton Dressed as Ram. <laughs> Fails to match up to, the, to those albums by Harrison and Lennon. Yeah. So, so you know, there were some positive ones, um, but the positive ones were not as vehemently positive as the negative ones were vehemently negative, uh, you know, and then there was Rolling Stone, which uh, at that point had an agenda and that agenda, you know, I think really drove a lot of our attitudes. I say our as, you know, meaning pretty much everyone I knew, you know, and, 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 and that's a shame in a way because they really didn't give Paul stuff a chance. Uh, and there was really no reason for those of us who were not party to the Apple lawsuit to really take sides. You know, there was, was really every reason that we could have just appreciated what all four of them were doing, but we weren't really mature enough to do that at the time because we were teenagers. <laughs> That's all I yeah. <laughs> But I, I was never caught up in the whole John versus Paul thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that never affected me at all. <laughs> I just loved all the music. You know, and and uh, loved all the differences between the musical styles of the four of them. Yeah. And just accepted it as such. Right. You know. Yeah. I just want to go back for one second about something you said before, Alan, about how you think that when Paul was working on Ram, that he didn't feel the pressure uh, of the success of All Things Must Pass. Or haven't there been times like you've heard it been said with like Band on the Run? The pressure was on for Paul because his fourth and fifth members had mm -hmm. just quit. Mm -hmm. Could he deliver? Mm -hmm. And uh, right after John died, 
you know, right. the pressure put on him to put out a quality album like Tug of War. Don't you think that he's affected during those moments? Oh, yeah. But um, what I was saying was you, you were specifically saying by all things must pass and Plastic Ono bands. But when uh, and I was just saying that when the session started, he hadn't heard those. So. But by the time that Ram came out, those two had already been released and had already done well. Right. Right. And then Ram, as you just heard, was compared negatively to to them in more than one review, yeah. I think. Yeah, I mean, there was, I think, a, you know, a competitive pressure, is, as, as I say, between all of them um, that probably also existed while they were in the Beatles and were bringing in songs and like, who's going to have the A side of the single, you know, that one. But, you know, I think that even in a vacuum where he didn't have to worry about what George's new album was going to sound like or what John's new album was going to sound like, you know, he has he has a certain level of pride in his own musicianship and creativity that is going to militate towards him wanting to try to put out the best thing he can. I mean, that's sometimes offset with a strange laziness, you know, <laughs> sorry. And laziness is, is not generally a word you can apply to someone who works as hard and as constantly as he does. But for instance, you know, he'll, he'll talk about how he doesn't really care that much about lyrics, you know, and that's up to him. That's, that's his choice. But I think that was the reason that a lot of us liked John in those days, because he did care about the lyrics and we were listening to the lyrics. And, you know, and the comparisons, you know, were, you know, usually in John's favor if you were going to compare. Yeah. But also what made the Beatles so fascinating, among other things, was the contrast yeah. between all four of them. Right. You know? And I do believe, like John said, that Paul can write great lyrics when he wants to. Right. So there are times when he's done it many times. And then there are times when he just doesn't put the effort in. But they fit the melody, and if lyrics don't mean as much to the listener, then they're okay with it. And, you know, I don't have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. There's one of the things um, that from time to time has always bothered me a bit about McCartney, because you could almost tell when, and it's a remarkable, uh, a remarkable indication of his talents, that not that he mails it in, but that maybe the effort isn't there or it's, it's directed in another direction. Uh, I still feel ultimately now that lyrically Egypt Station is a weak album. Yeah, because there's stuff that he's done that's got more oomph to it. Even some of the lyrics on McCartney 3 are, are, are to me, better than, than Egypt Station. Paul has that reputation of being that type uh, type writer. Not, not being a typewriter, but being <laughs> that type of writer. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, but when he when he tries... When he when he does the effort, I mean, again, look at Backseat of My Car. I mean, apart from musically that being a brilliant track, the lyrics make it into kind of a little mini opera. You know, these kids in the car, it's a it's, you know, in a way he's writing much younger than he was at the time. You know, this is a, this is a teenage song, which he said at the time. They want to go out riding, you know, their parents are saying, don't stay out too long and, you know, sort of uh, warning them against, you know, premarital sex and all that, all the, the whole scene. And they just want to take off and drive down to Mexico City. It's, it's like a movie, you know, it's an incredible piece. And if he had just sort of phoned in the lyrics it would have been beautiful musically, but it wouldn't have worked so well as a, a total creation. Hmm. Well, you know, <laughs> this is such a complicated thing to talk about. You know, we could do a whole show up on, you know, what we look for in music uh, and every fan is different. There are plenty of times when McCartney writes the most amazing melody and the arrangement's fantastic and the musicianship is fantastic. And maybe the lyrics are just OK. And it's still a great song to me. Yeah. You don't have to have great lyrics to have a great song. Great lyrics can enhance a song, definitely. But for me, it's always been more about the melody than anything else. And the arrangement and production does count, but not as important as the melody and, and to a lesser degree, the lyrics. But there are some people in this world for whom the lyrics are even more important. And you can't tell people how to feel. <laughs> sure. So, um, you know, there's 
plenty of McCartney songs where the melodies are absolutely amazing and he puts a lot of effort into the arrangement of the song, but the lyrics aren't incredible and yet you can love it on its own level. And the songs have value and they're valid that way. Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, um, let's find out what your impression is today, uh, especially Darren, because uh, you talked about when it first came out of this album. Do you rate it, you know, amongst his best? I know what Alan said, being one of his best, but maybe not the best. How about you, Darren? Uh, it is amongst his best, I think. Uh, it's my second favorite behind Band on the Run. That period uh, of uh, 70, I guess 70, I guess you start 71 to 73 is probably my favorite period anyway, because my three favorite McCartney albums are uh, Band on the Run, Ram, and Red Rose Speedway in that order. Uh, Red Rose Speedway, a little more of a sentimental pick. I realize it's got, it may not hold up amongst some of McCartney's other landmark albums, but it's for personal purposes. I bump it up like right behind Ram. I believe Red Rose Speedway was the first one I had my own. I had it on cassette. Uh, but Ram, um, I've always liked Ram. I don't think I truly got the significance of, of it as a piece of, uh, as a work, as an entire work until I got a, a much older. And, uh, it's his most Beatlish album. Uh, it so many songs on Ram. I could see of being tunes that the Beatles might have worked on had they stayed together and were doing an album in the early seventies. It is really perhaps the best example of McCartney's strengths as a songwriter and performer, because it's got little samplings of everything that McCartney does best, from song craft to vocalist to bass player etc so you know i find it uh, I, and there's not a weak song in my opinion there's not a weak song on the album i know some folks might say am yeah, monkberry moon delight or you know smile away which i think was my favorite song on the album when i first heard it just because the lyrics are funny when you're a kid you know hey your feet smell you know that was like <laughs> yeah, that's hysterical <laughs> um i just think it's perfection and uh I definitely would say, you know, Ben on the Run Ram, if you're looking to get two McCartney albums, you're just getting introduced to McCartney, those are the two to go with. Hmm. Alan, anything you want to add to what you've previously said? Um, I think I've probably said enough. Um, I, I, I have a real hard time ranking his albums. Uh, you know, I, I probably in some ways agree with Darren, but it, it changes. You know, sometimes I think Flowers in the Dirt's my favorite of his albums. There, there you go. I think, um, I think McCartney three is up there. Really. There are a number of songs on that that really have stayed with me um, far more than Egypt station. I agree with Darren about that. Um, although I didn't dislike Egypt station. So yeah, I, I, I don't really have a, a, a semi official ranking of them. Um, there are just some that work for me better than others. I'm not sure there are any absolutely horrible albums of his. I can't think of of one, you know, I, what would it be, Darren? <laughs> I think that um, uh, McCartney's catalog uh, has a handful of classics, has few stinkers, but so many albums that are really good, um, very good but could have been better had it not been for one or two weak moments. For me, the low point for McCartney is give my regards to Broad Street, uh, which technically does and doesn't count because it's a soundtrack. But And if I had to then say, all right, let's put that one aside. For me, the low point was Pipes of Peace. Hmm. I've never really been that big of a fan of the first half of the 80s, including Tug of War. Don't throw eggs at me. Um, hmm. whereas to me Harrison's never really made a bad album Lennon has made the classics imagine the Plastic Ono band and Ringo's when he's on can hold his own with the others but McCartney the bulk of his catalog to me is all very enjoyable with very few stinkers yet only a handful of albums you could say boy that's a masterpiece mm -hmm. did any of that did that make sense 
Mm. McCartney's records always seem to have, even the really good ones, one or two songs that like kind of weigh it down a little bit. So some people may love Flowers in the Dirt, and I do. But, uh, you know, to me, you know, there's a couple of songs on Flowers in the Dirt that maybe hold it back a little bit. I love the song craft of Tug of War. My problem with Tug of War always has been it was so middle of the road and so it was almost like soft rock McCartney. Adult uh, contemporary. Yeah, that when that even when that first came out and I was 18 years old, I was maybe back to the egg was a bad influence for me. And then tug of war comes out a couple of years later. And it was like, I liked the guitars better than, you know, the, uh, the sweet pop songs. So I'm getting off topic here, but you know, for me, the low point would be press to play, uh, not press to play pipes of peace and give my regards to broad street. Hmm. Okay. Well, we all differ a bit. When we look back at uh, McCartney's catalog and there's so much to pick from, there's over 30 studio albums. And um, for me personally, Ram is one of his best, but I I truly think that, um, and I would apply this to all the solo Beatle albums. I've never considered any of them to be bad albums. They all go from good to great, not counting all the experimental Johnny Yoko, Life with the Lions. (laughs) Sorry, Alan. Or electronic sound, not not counting those albums, you know, and uh, you'll find this with every artist. Not every single album is a great album. Very quick. This has nothing to do with anything. And not so we don't belabor the point in a nutshell. Is there one of the solo albums from the four of them that you have never listened to or don't recall listening to from beginning to end? No, oh. I would say <laughs> I don't think I've ever sat and listened to electronic sound from start to finish. Mm. I don't recall it at least. Mm. And if I did once, same thing with Wedding Album. <laughs> wedding Album, I know I've, I've listened through because I just wanted to see how long I would hold up. But I don't think I've ever listened to electronic sound. Anyway, back to Ram, back to McCartney. Off yeah. Me. And uh, where McCartney's concerned, there are about 10 or 11 albums, I think, that I would list as being truly great albums where I like every single song or maybe every song but one, and it could still be a great album. You know, even with Ram, which is as close to flawless as possible to me, the only song I ever had a problem with was Long Haired Lady, and that's only because I felt it went on too long. It could have been trimmed by a minute or so. But there's so much to love about Ram in terms of the songwriting, in terms of the production, all the different sounds that you got out of it, the ukulele on Ram on. You know, and I love the way that song starts, you know, with that piano, uh, that piano intro there going into the ukulele. This, there's a lot of, um, I keep going back to that word quirky. I like quirkiness in an album. And sometimes when an artist does something where he puts effort in, he wants it to be the best that it can be, but he's not really so concerned about this has to be a hit. I'm just doing what I want to do and having fun with it. When you've got an album like that, that's what I think Ram was to me. You know, doing a song uh, with nonsensical lyrics like Monkberry Moon Delight, or having fun with a song like Smile Away and not caring about what the critics might say about it, you know, takes balls. (laughs) And a lot of people like McCartney more when he doesn't care about having a hit record or what the public might think or putting an album out that of what the public expects of him. So I get that from the DIY albums. A lot of people think that about Paul. And, and I think um, to some degree, you can certainly say the same thing for Ram, even though, you know, so many of these songs are, are absolutely brilliant and brilliant compositions and really crafted so well. I love the, the lead guitar work in, um, in, in too many people. You know, and the way that it ends with with the lead guitar stuff, it's it's so unique in its in its own way. Sounds that you don't commonly hear or arrangements of songs that that you don't commonly hear. And Uncle Albert Admiral Halsey, what a masterpiece that is. So, yeah, those are my feelings about the album. So we're now going to talk about uh, a new tribute album that just came out for Ram called Ram On. And Denny Sywell has been involved with this album as co-producer, 
along with a guy named Fernando Perdomo, who has been uh, a part of the L.A. music scene for uh, quite some time now. He's, um, he's done production work. He's a singer-songwriter. He's played uh, a variety of instruments. He's a great guitar player. He's also been in the uh, Netflix documentary of Echo in the Canyon, and he's backing up Brian Wilson, as well as uh, Nora Jones in the film and uh, Regina Spector. He played, he actually played on the official soundtrack album of the film, along with um, Eric Clapton, Neil Young, and Stephen Stills. And he's played with people like Todd Rundgren and Curved Air, and also the very last Emmett Rhodes album he played on Mm. as well. So the two of them uh, worked on this uh, tribute, covering every single song that was on Ram, including the single For Another Day and A Woman Oh Why. And I actually did an interview with, uh, with Denny Sywell and Fernando Perdomo individually. That's now on my YouTube channel for Ken Michaels Radio. But um, if you want to know a lot more about the background behind this album, certainly the way Fernando explains it, because he really is the one who started this whole thing rolling. I'll just give you a, a brief explanation how this whole thing started. A few years ago, uh, Fernando became friends with Denny Sywell. They live nearby, and Fernando had him just do a, a drum track for two songs, one of which was a cover of Some People Never Know. And as, as we got closer to the 50th anniversary of Ram, it wasn't like Fernando had the intention of doing an album like this. He wanted to put together a concert with friends of his, musicians all playing songs from the Ram album in its entirety. But because of the pandemic, that definitely ended those plans. So he went in this route and called on Denny to lay down drum tracks for all the songs from Ram. And then through all the friends that he knew in the music business, he called on them. He asked them to participate. These were all people that loved the Ram album thoroughly, uh, an album that uh, for many of musicians, it's in their DNA. They know the album frontwards and backwards. And they sent them tracks that he had to all put together digitally on Pro Tools in his studio. And so every single song from Ram is covered here. And, um, you know, you've got a lot of people like, for example, uh, Pat Sansone of Wilco is on there. I mentioned John Montagna, who's been a guest on our show, and I just interviewed him on my YouTube channel as well. He plays bass on a couple of songs. Uh, you've got Will Lee showing up, uh, on one of the songs, Davey Johnstone from Elton John's band plays on Smile Away, as does John Montagna on that song and another day. David Spinoza actually appears on the album as well. And they got the original trumpet player or flugelhorn player, Marvin Stagg, who was on Uncle Albert Admiral Halsey to do the trumpet solo or flugelhorn solo. And so, um, they put together this this album, and I wanted to know from the two of you, because you've both listened to it, what your impression has been uh, of Ram On. And why don't we start with you, Darren? I am sort of funny when it comes to tribute albums. I tend to prefer, if you're going to do a tribute album, if you're going to do an interpretation of a song or an album, I would prefer that you kind of like take the song and try to make it your own and kind of keep some, some thread of familiar, um, but um, work with the tune. You're paying tribute to the artist by pre- recording the song. Uh, it, that right there, period, you've accomplished your goal, but, you know, play around with it, kind of, you know, reinvent a portion of it. I feel, I feel like I'm talking about I mean, McCartney three imagine. So in the case of Ram on, most of this album, I would go with so far to say 95 if not percent, if not more, is a note for note cover of the McCartney album down to even studio noise and sound effects and maybe a scream that McCartney throws in there. A lot of that is copied, uh, which took away from the experience. It's impeccably performed. The musicianship's outstanding. No surprise to all the people you mentioned, Ken, that play on the album. Kind of like a like a session player free for all. 
you know, who's playing bass on this track is playing bass on that track and that guitarist is, you know, and, and, it, and this is also giving a chance for a lot of, uh, I guess most of these musicians are LA based or at least have significant ties to the LA music scene. It's giving some artists that aren't household names uh, a chance to, uh, you know, come forth and shine. But my big problem with Ram on mainly is that it is a, a note for note copy of McCartney's Ram. And I would have liked something a little more, you know, that took some more chances. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a couple of tracks should, should leave it alone. Copy it. You know, you want to do a straight, a straight note for note. Fine, but not the entire album. That said, uh, I'm sure there are going to be plenty of people where that appeals to folks. Tribute bands are big today. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so many tribute bands will copy the band that they're, that they're copying note for note. And a lot of people prefer that. I don't. So I'm glad it's here. I'm glad it's an option. I can't imagine why I would put it on when I could just put on McCartney's album. I very much am a Denny Sywell fan. Uh, I enjoy uh, the two uh, Denny Sywell trio jazz albums that he's done in recent years. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think his drumming is outstanding on this album. Just, you know, note for note. It's like putting McCartney's Ram on a copying machine and running off a copy of it. You know, that's, that's, what, that's what this is. A few interesting people. Uh, you mentioned Pat Sansone who's a friend. I have known him from not only Wilco, but uh, the Autumn Defense, which is a great band that he fronts with Wilco's bass player, John Stewart. Eric Dober is on this album, and he was a, a, a late member of Jellyfish. And I'm sure there's plenty of uh, Beatle people out there who love Jellyfish. And he's worked, you know, in uh, a couple of other notable bands. And Durger McBroom, who for a number of years was one of the vocalists with backing vocalists with Pink Floyd. In fact, pretty much all of the post Roger Waters period, when Floyd toured, Durger McBroom was one of the backing vocalists with them. And another connection, which I didn't know this till earlier today, her band Blue Pearl is actually her and Youth mm. from, from The Fireman, which right. I never knew. So, uh, you know, Ram on, uh, it's too much of a exact copy of McCartney's, um, of the original. Mm, OK, I should have said before I even asked your opinion, Darren, that this is very faithful. These are faithful arrangements to the originals. And um, Alan, uh, how do you feel about the approach that was taken on this tribute? I um, largely agree with Darren. I do think one of its benefits is that the the technology allows for sort of a clearer view of some of of the songs you can hear uh, in some cases a lot more of what's going on in in dense textured things but yeah I don't know why I would put it on instead of uh, RAM but here's the thing with with tribute tribute bands tribute projects whatever you know with with Beatles tribute bands for instance you know those are sort of made to work live because it's okay. You're not going to see the Beatles in a concert situation, but someone can play the music the way they did using Mm -hmm. their arrangements, using their bass lines and everything else and getting it right. And you can have the live experience of hearing that music um, rather than just listening to the records over and over. I don't tend to do that all that much, but uh, a lot of people enjoy that, and I can understand that. On a record, it's sort of, uh, um, I don't know. I mean, how often do you listen to the Beatlemania soundtrack album, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And this is a little bit like that. And the thing that is weird for me in trying to formulate, you know, how to express my opinion about it is the fact that in my other life in classical music, you know, that's what it is. A composer writes a score, the players play the score. There's obviously variation in each recording. People take different tempos, people use different balances, uh, you know, and if, and if you know the stuff really well, a lot of the time, if a, 
a recording comes on the radio, you can tell whose recording it is because of what they do with it. But it basically is the same notes every time. So why do I accept that with classical music, but somehow feel suspicious of it with rock? And I think it's because of another thing Darren said, you know, in, in, in classical music, fidelity to the score is something that is expected and prized. But in pop music, when someone covers a song, you expect them to, as Darren said, make it their own. You expect them to do something else with it. I think in this case, you know, possibly one of the things that happened is the pandemic, you know, because it had to be assembled the way Ken described, you know, track by track with everyone working separately. There wasn't an opportunity for all the musicians in a particular song, because the personnel changes song by song, but for, for everyone to be in a room and just sort of play off each other and see what happens. You know, you're, you're expected in this case to learn a part the way it was when Ram was recorded originally and play that part, which makes sense to do in that kind of recording situation where everyone is separate, you know, unless you can get a sort of mega zoom thing going where you're all recording it at the same time and you're hearing each other at the same time and you can play against each other. You know, I'm not sure what's going to happen in, in a cover, you know, but obviously that wasn't the goal here. The goal here was a, a faithful recreation of, of Ram. And, you know, if that was the goal, they reached the goal, you know, you, you got to give them points for that. And, and, it, and it is, you know, very well played and sung. And, uh, you know, it's it's enjoyable, but I, I don't know how often I'll play it because I have the original. Oh. So it's like that, you know, sort of mixed feelings. Like, you know, like Darren, I, I, you know, I like Danny Sywell a lot. And um, I like a lot of the musicians individually in it for their work in other contexts. And so I sort of feel bad saying this, uh, you know, that I'm probably not going to listen to it a lot, but I mean, that's the reality. So, so there it is. Hmm. Okay. Well, for me, um, I kind of go back and forth with what the two of you have said. The thing is that I always like when attention is given to an album like this one, which uh, I'm glad to see is more appreciated now than ever before. I like to see tribute albums given to lesser known works of an artist. I would be thrilled if um, there was a tribute album, say, to Tug of War, you know, or Mind Games or something like that. Anytime attention's given to a work that isn't really appreciated as much as we think it should be, and I know Ram is now far more appreciated than it was in the past, that I'm all for it. And I also appreciate when an artist goes to the trouble to study the song and try to copy it as much as they can. But, you know, like the two of you said, why bother listening to this when you can listen to Paul's Ram? I will tell you definitely that if I was to see a tribute band for Ram give a concert and they were going to play every single song and do it note for note and study it like, like Beatle bands study Beatle songs, I'd be right there. I'd love to see something like that. But one of the things that I do like about this album is that, yeah, it's very faithful, but there are some differences. And it was produced extremely well, despite the fact that you didn't have all the musicians in the studio at the same time. It's not like I would say these recordings are sterile in any way. It still has a liveliness aspect to it. It captured the spirit of the original album. And there are moments in there in the arrangements when there are some things that were applied that weren't in Paul's recordings at all. There's a piano solo that's in Eat at Home. There's a guitar solo in Eat at Home that's not the same thing that you hear on the record. Mm -hmm. You know, there's uh, some guitar playing, lead guitar playing towards the end of Uncle Albert and Admiral Halsey that I hadn't heard in Paul's recording of that. And I do like the fact that the guitar playing that leads right into Smile Away is copied. I thought that was pretty cool to pay that attention to detail like that. I, I really enjoyed that. You know, certain songs like Dear Boy, for example, a lot of work was put into that song from Paul with all the harmonies. There's layers and layers of harmony on that song. And I felt that there was work put into this recording of it as well. 
I, I get a big kick out of someone trying to copy Ramon with the ukulele there and the piano intro, like I said before. Um, oh, Woman, Oh, Why was actually approached as a duet between a man and a woman. A different approach altogether. And I like that. Um, as Fernando has explained, Backseat of My Car was sung by a guy named Brentley Gore. And he actually contracted COVID right at this time when they needed his vocal. And he did it like the day before COVID really kicked in for him. And a song like that, as Fernando has explained, is one of the most difficult to record because, you know, you're you're singing it in your normal vocal range throughout most of the song. And then he's got that big screaming part at the end. So to adjust to that, to do this completely different vocal, it's not that easy to pull that off. So I know that these songs are not the easiest to record. Look at Monkberry Moon Delight. Timmy Sean is the lead singer on, on that particular song. He also does Smile Away. To sing Monkberry Moon Delight all the way through with that kind of voice, that screaming voice, continuous for five minutes, that's really difficult to pull off. So I admire it for that reason. You know, but um, you know, I, I've grown to really enjoy cover versions more and more through the years. But like the both of you has, have said, I appreciate it more when an artist does their own arrangement to a song and, you know, there's more work put into it that way. It's very difficult when you're dealing with something like the Beatles catalog to make your cover your own because everything's going to be compared to the Beatles. And to some people, you can't top the Beatles anyway. But when you do put effort in to do your own arrangement, I admire that, you know, and there have been great covers of Beatles songs. And, you know, like I said, to tackle this particular album, to put the attention to detail that was done by all these musicians. I do appreciate that. And um, I also know that uh, Denny Saiwa was involved, more involved uh, in this album than just drumming because he approved all the singers for all the songs. And they didn't want to take this approach of having some superstar band. They didn't want a traveling Wilburys to do <laughs> Ram. <laughs> It wanted, he wanted to be, you know, respectable artists and, and some of these names are recognizable, but not, you know, superstar status to most people to do these songs. And they cared more about capturing, you know, the feel and the vibe and the spirit of Ram. And I think they did that, you know, so I know that I'm going to be listening to this more often. I know that I'm going to work it into my radio show, every little thing. And it's just cool to know that anybody's covering these songs so you know for all those reasons put together i do like this album but yeah i can easily understand and what you said about the album beatlemania you're right on the money there alan you know i would never <laughs> put on the beatlemania album why bother you know mm -hmm. listening to a beatles tribute band when you could have the real thing so i can understand you know this might be hypocritical of me to be supportive of ramon but yet because it's such a unique album, it's so so tough to duplicate these songs. I love it for that reason and more. Okay. So there you go. All right, so that puts this show to a close. And um, why don't we give everybody uh, our contact information and, and let them know what's going on with us. We'll start with you, Darren. All right. Uh, first up, you want to check me out on WFUV. Uh, I'm on the air Monday through Thursday nights at 10 p.m. Uh, and Saturday afternoons at 1 on WFUV, which is at 90.7 FM in New York City, uh, the New York City metropolitan area. And uh, if you still have uh, are into the HD radio thing, as far as I know, our HD2 signal is still percolating uh, at 90.7 FM. HD2, stream us at WFUV.org or get our app and listen to us there. And as I said, 10 p.m. Monday through Thursday nights, one in the afternoon, Saturdays. Uh, and if you want to reach me on Facebook, I have two Facebook pages. You could simply send me a friend request at Darren DeVivo or go to my other page and click like. But you'll find me on Facebook, and I'll get you on both of the both of the pages. All right, very good, Alan. How about you? 
Okay, the easiest way to find me is on Facebook, either under Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And also there is a McCartney Legacy Facebook page. It is mostly run by Adrian, um, but I pop up there now and then. And either one of us sort of are listed as McCartney Legacy when we post there, so uh, it's not always easy to tell. But um, anyway, there's that. Uh, you can contact uh, all of us here on Things We Said Today at Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. We have a Twitter feed that is at Things We Said Fab. And we also have two Facebook pages. One is just Things We Said Today, one is Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans. We always post the shows on both of those Facebook pages and various other Facebook pages that we have peripheral interests in or, you know whatever. And you can find us, you can find the shows otherwise on YouTube and Podbean and iTunes. But if you're listening to me say this, you probably already know where to find them. So over to you, Ken. All right. If you want to get in contact with me directly, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. You can also friend me on Facebook at Ken Michaels. Uh, by all means, please check out my relatively new youtube channel it's been a busy channel of late as i mentioned before just recently i interviewed both denny sywell and fernando perdomo separately to talk about the new ramon tribute and uh certainly in the interview with denny he talks a lot about working on the original ram album and working with paul during the wings days there's also a whole bunch of number nine dream shows that i've done in the last few weeks with al sussman with uh, Ethan Alexanian, a young podcaster, uh, and Tom Hunyadi, uh, my fellow co-host on the Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast podcast, and he's also co-host of the Two Legs Solo McCartney podcast. And uh, I also interviewed John Montagna, the bass player who is on the new Ramon uh, tribute. And by the way, let me just mention, since so many of these people that we talked about here on this show have actually been on this show. <laughs> Things we said today, uh, Denny Sywell uh, has appeared twice. John Montagna has been on the show twice. So by all means do check out the older shows that they've been on and there'll be lots of talk about Ram. I'm sure coming from Denny on those shows. Uh, talk more talk, a solo Beatles video cast airs every other Monday night. The next show is next Monday which is May the 24th. And guess what? We're all going to be talking about Ram. <laughs> Why? <Only getting>, <laughs> and Fernando Perdomo is going to be a guest on that show. So he's going to be talking about the Ram on tribute, his feelings about Ram, uh, and why it's to him like the greatest album of all time. Hmm. And you can get that on my YouTube page as well. And then there's my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. Don't forget all the different interviews that I have on there. Denny Sywell's on there, too. And Beatles Trivia, every single week to win one of ten prizes. You might see Ram. You might see Ram on as a, as a prize in weeks to come. Make sure you uh, click on my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, and you'll find out what great prizes I give away every single week. And that about wraps things up. This has been an incredible conversation talking about Ram. And uh, I want to thank all of you for listening. And for Darren DeVivo and Alan Cozen, this is Ken Michaels once again saying thanks for tuning in. And Ram on. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.